Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little count in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is no money, nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you've been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. A little further on, he says, But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, blessed All Saints Day to you. The text I just read will become clear in a minute why I chose that particular text. But uh, I would ask that you would go ahead and turn back into your bulletin. Uh, if you notice on the front cover of the bulletin, names of the individuals who have gone to be with the Lord in the last, since the last All Saints Sunday. A tradition here to, to list them. And then in the learning of the language of the church, this comment about All Saints Day... And from the Augsburg Confession, I have to read that again. The Augsburg Confession states, It is also taught among us that saints should be kept in remembrance so that our faith may be strengthened when we see what grace they received and how they were sustained by faith. Moreover, their good works are to be an example for us, each of us in his own calling. And so his imperial majesty may in salutary and godly fashion imitate the example of David in making war on the Turk, for both are incumbents of a royal office which demands the defense and protection of their subjects. Uh, this particular day of All Saints Day has many uh, important meanings and concepts connected with it. But at first we have to ask, what is it? who's a saint? Who's a saint? Uh, and the church uses this term in, in more than one way, actually. Um, The church has used it to reference uh, those individuals who had a special place in the history of the church. They were teachers, apostles, these sort of things. Uh, But the scriptures use this term most often as a reference to all believers. Are you a believer in Christ Jesus? You're a saint. You probably didn't think that, right? Don't think of yourself as a saint? God does. What does saint mean? Saint means holy one. Are you holy? Well, yes and no, right? In and of yourself, no. But in Christ Jesus, yes. You were sanctified, you were washed, you were justified. You are holy. It's the point of the forgiveness of sins, right? The opposite of sin is unholiness. You are made forgiven if you are covered in the blood of Christ. If his work is done in your behalf, you are now holy. God no longer sees your sins, but he sees you through Christ Jesus as his precious child, perfect and complete as his son was because of what he did for you. And so it's All Saints Day, not just those the church has memorized and reminded of. And those are important, too. I mean, my stole is the symbols of all the apostles. Uh, we remember them also. But each of those has its own day. But All Saints Day is about all of us, all who are believers in Christ Jesus. In fact, that's exactly how Paul used it in that text. One of the reasons I read that text to start off with from 1 Corinthians 6. He's, Paul says he's talking to whom? The saints. The saints are able to judge in these matters, he tells them. You're holy ones. You are God's chosen people. You can make decisions in these sort of matters. 
And he even goes on and says this amazing thing. Don't you know that we're going to judge angels? If, we can, if we're going to judge angels, how much more are we able to judge the things of this life? And he's not talking to a special group of people within the congregation. He's not talking just to the leaders. He's talking to every believer in the church. Paul does this quite often when he writes, for example, to the saints in Ephesus or the saints in Galatia. He's not talking about a specific group that's only part of the congregation. He's talking to the whole congregation. We're all holy in Christ Jesus, covered in the blood of Christ. Saints, holy ones. That's what saints means, holy ones. Not in our own holiness, but in Christ's holiness. In other words, what God gave that gift of salvation, he intends for all. All saints. All of us. And that has implications for Paul. That they are able to judge things. In fact, they are called upon to judge things. To decide and determine what is right and what is wrong. Now, there are offices that are given in the church. The Augsburg Confession makes that point. The fact that you have this apostle stole makes that point. Not everybody's an apostle. But the position of apostles and especially of pastors and those in authority of the church, they have two things they can do. They can say, thus saith the Lord, when they have a direct word and command from God, and they can only offer their advice. The two are not the same. The thus saith the Lord is something that clearly the Lord has revealed. You, you should be baptized. The Lord has revealed that. I can say, thus saith the Lord. You are to receive the body and blood of Christ when you are prepared for that. I can say, thus saith the Lord. What you dress in when you come, I don't, can't say. I can give advice. I could say, well, maybe you should wear something that's appropriate to the great occasion that you're coming to to receive the body and blood of Christ. But I can't lay down any laws or rules. I can only give you my advice. Uh, we've always understood this in the church for pastors. This is Walter's great understanding of the church, the royal priesthood. I compare it sometimes to, it's kind of like an attorney and a jury. Right? Do the attorneys decide the case? No. Who decides the case? The jury does. And yet, the jury doesn't just say, well, we're not going to listen to any arguments. We're just going to go decide it on our own. No. Somebody comes in, right, and presents the case, both sides. As a pastor, I'm kind of the attorney saying, okay, this is, this is the case. But you folks have to decide whether it fits or does not fit. When we're, and we're talking audi offer here, things that are neither commanded nor forbidden in Scripture, whether it, it fits or not for us. In this congregation. Some things, of course, I have a thus saith the Lord, and, and you have to be obedient to that. But other things, I have no thus saith the Lord, and it's a matter of us discussing it together and trying to decide what's best for us as a community of God's people in this place. All saints, all equal. Uh, all saints day, Paul makes that point with regard to um, the Corinthians. Did you notice, by the way, uh, part of the reason we remember saints is to follow their example, to see their example. And the Augsburg Confession has a specific thing in mind here. It says, moreover, their good works are to be an example for us, each of us in his own calling. And so there are examples and there are examples, right? So the example of Abraham that God told him to leave his country and his family, God didn't say to you, that's not your calling. You don't just you don't pick up and say, hey, I'm leaving I'm leaving because God told Abraham to leave. That must mean what I'm supposed to do. That's not your calling. But with the emperor, look what the Augsburg Confession says. So his imperial majesty may in salutary and godly fashion imitate the example of David in making war on the Turk. David didn't make war on the Turk. He made war on others. For both are incumbents, and here it comes, of a royal office. It's his calling, it's his vocation, it's what God has placed him to do, which demands the defense and protection of their subjects. And so, you and I can't take up the sword, but David could, Emperor Charles could, President Obama can, our Congress can, okay? 
but we can't because they've been given an office. We, we don't follow their example and everything. We always have to ask, is this our office? Paul in 1 Corinthians is making the point, though, that there's a lot of things that fall into the jurisdiction of the saints. In this particular case, he's talking about lawsuits, isn't he? Um, that people, believers were having against each other. And he says, why are you going to the unbelieving world? You're able to decide in these matters. You're saints. Right? And he... Um, C.F.W. Walter would point out that because we're all saints, the royal priesthood, right? We saw there's an office of the high priest in the Hebrews text we heard. That's Jesus. But the royal priesthood is all believers, all of us, all saints. We all have the right to judge things. And this was then Walter's basis, for example, of his famous book, The Congregation's Right to Choose Its Pastor. Nobody from above can uh, force a pastor on a congregation because you're the saints. You're to decide these things. Uh, you know better than anybody else what you need. Now, you do it like, though, like the jury, right? You have the attorneys come in and, and make their case, but you decide. And we've always recognized this, for example, where Walther says that a congregation would be wise to seek the advice of some experienced pastors, especially the district president. In our Constitution, part of the thing we agree to is to seek the advice of the district president. Notice there, read closely there, seek his advice. That doesn't mean you have to take it. And it's very similar to the pastor and his congregation in matters of adiaphora. Pastor is not only allowed to, I would argue his office requires him to give his advice on matters. But it's only that, it's advice. It's not thus saith the Lord. And the congregation can decide otherwise. A few years back, I wanted to have the parish hall on this side. You notice our parish hall is on this side, right? (laughs) Congregation spelt differently. It's okay. That's your right as saints. Uh, But we do recognize that you should seek advice. Even the apostles, Walter makes the point, even the apostles would distinguish between their own advice and what they were bringing from the Lord. Paul would sometimes say, thus saith the Lord. I have a command from Christ. I have a command from God. you got to do it. If you don't do it, you're not a Christian. And sometimes he would say, this is my advice. And they would be wise to do what? To consider it, to listen to it. It doesn't mean that they would ultimately take it. Uh, if, otherwise, he wouldn't say, this is merely advice. He'd say, thus saith the Lord. Um, all saints reminds us of this great uh, blessing we have as congregations. We are able to make these decisions. Now, of course, there are some limits. Uh, you have to call somebody, for example, who is a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Why? Because you're a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. This congregation is. Now, Walther would say you have a right to call somebody who's not Missouri Synod, and then you have a right to leave because it's a voluntary organization, and part of that is to be part of uh, the Senate. And why is that? Because of the concern, what, about false prophets. And uh, we, have a, we have a command from God to avoid false prophets. Uh, we can't just bring anybody in and, and let them be your pastor if they're not going to uh, be in line with what we have agreed upon as a Senate, as a church body. But the congregation can choose anybody Anyone on the roster. Anyone. And the district president doesn't decide that. And if he does, he's going contrary to our polity and our theology. He can only, only offer his advice. The congregation does not have to take it. Um, it's important to know. Not that I'm looking for a call, don't get worried. But when the day comes someday, you need to know that. You need to know that, what your rights and responsibilities are as a congregation, as being part of the royal priesthood of being all saints. This is what has been granted to us by Christ. And so we remember saints to remind us of the great gifts that the Lord has given us, the vocations, the callings that he has placed us in as members of the congregation. You have a calling. Your calling is what? To be concerned about the congregation. Um, And so you want to make sure things are done properly in order, this sort of thing. We develop things like constitutions and stuff like that. And these are not commanded either, but we agree upon them. If we've written it in our constitution, 
Until we change that, we're going to abide by that because we want order. We want things to be done orderly. Uh, but they could be changed at some point. Uh, in fact, there's no command from God to have a constitution. By the way, that's also part of our agreement, though, as a church body, to have constitutions. So that the synod knows what we're doing. <laughs> and they have a right to that. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the, one of the main clauses in our constitution is that our congregations have a right of self-governance. Right of self um, this is, by the way, I don't know if you know this, this sets our par- church apart from many, many other denominations. One of the things where it is, is we own our own property. The district does not own this property. The Missouri Synod does not own this property. If this congregation decides the Missouri Synod has become a false teaching church, we don't lose the property. We lead with our property. One of the great benefits that's given to us with our polity and understanding of these things. Not every church body has that. If you were a member of the ELCA and you left, you left without the property because that's what they kind of developed in their polity now. Uh, But we recognize the priesthood of all believers. We recognize your ability as all the saints to judge in matters of doctrine and practice. Again, to be good judges, right, to do what? To hear the facts, you know, not just, oh, put my finger which way was the wind blowing, but like any good jury, right? I like that's why I like that analogy, to listen to the arguments, and then you often decide what's right. Um, it's a great gift, and it's a great responsibility. It does mean that we should be, uh, I would say, try to, to some extent, understand our polity, understand what our church teaches on things, so that we know we have these, so we know that our responsibility is in these things. Uh, We remember the saints because they remind us of vocation, too, where each of us has been placed, where God has placed us in a holy place. To be a mother is just as holy as to be a pastor. To be a bricklayer is just as holy as to be a pastor. When you do it as a Christian, uh, for the glory of God. This is one of Luther's also great understandings for the priesthood of all believers and the idea of us all being saints. It's not what we do that makes us holy. It's not our job that makes us holy. But who we do it for. And why the the fact that we're covered in the blood of Christ, we do it as Christians, as his holy people. Um, And so we believe that you can serve in the government and still be a Christian. Their churches don't believe that. Right? Uh, Notice the Augsburg Confession doesn't say to Emperor Charles, you're sinning by being emperor. No. They they recognize, in fact, they speak of him as a Christian, fellow Christian. They appeal to him as a fellow Christian. It's not what you do, your vocation, that makes you holy. It's holy because of who you do it for and who you belong to and what he's done for you. And that's, of course, the first part and the main reason we remember all saints. I love the saints because all the saints... You start thinking about, they're not saints because they're perfect, right? So Peter, right? Peter's perfect, right? Yeah. Um, how many times does he deny his Lord? Oh, yeah, that's right, three times. Uh, and who's Paul got to chastise in Galatians for goofing up? Oh, yeah, Peter. And in fact, if you look at all, of the, all the ones who are the examples of the faith, they all had their times of failing. And yet, God was merciful to them. God continued to use them. And God uses us in spite of the fact that we fail. We're sinners. Um, I remember my ordination sitting up front, and they were reading these passages, and I was bawling my eyes out because I'm thinking, Who do I, what right do I have to think I can be a pastor? And it came to me, it, was, it has nothing to do with who I am, but what Christ has done for me and where he's sending me. It's not about me. Um, and so the saints remind us of who we belong to. Notice the confession says, it's talking about the saints should be kept in remembrance so that our faith may be strengthened when we see what grace they received and how they were sustained by faith. They had to have grace. Why? Because they were sinners too. God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, came for sinners, not perfect people. 
You wonder if the Lord can use you? Are you a sinner? The Lord can use you. Because that's who he came for. That's who he sanctifies. That's who he makes holy. Sinners. If we could do it, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. He can't. He has done it for us. And so this is where this notion, you ever heard Luther quoted sometimes, is sin boldly. We can sin boldly. In other words, you don't know what to do? Just do it. Do it for the Lord. And it's covered in the blood of Christ. Don't get all worked up over whether you're perfect or right enough or whatever. The Lord's calling you, placing you there. Do it. And it can be done joyfully because you know it's covered in the blood of Christ. There's times we make decisions as a congregation we don't know, right? It would be nice to have a sign, right? Lord, give me a sign. Which way should we go? We don't know. We just use our best common sense we can, and we know it's done for God's glory. And we simply lay it before him and say, where we've, where we've goofed up, Lord, forgive. And he does. Just as he forgives in our personal lives again and again and again. Because we're the holy ones. We're the saints. Not because of us, but because of Jesus and his death in our place. Thanks be to God. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus always. Amen.